remember years ago when I um, was pastoring in South Carolina, I remember sitting in one of my friend's homes, I was there to visit, and, and I got the call that my grandfather, Lyle Kane, who just used to live down the road here, uh, had died. And I remember it caught me off guard how much painful, searing loss that felt at that moment. And I remember coming back here for the funeral. I went to Jackson Lytle Funeral Home over on Limestone, and I walked into that main room there on the left, and, and down at the end I could see the casket with my grandfather laying there. And it kind of shook me because it looked like my dad lay in there. Now my dad and I don't look anything alike, I'm sure, to any of you, but I remember thinking, oh, I can't. Can't handle that. I remember thinking, being very afraid that I'd, I wouldn't be able to, to handle that when my dad's time came. And I, I didn't handle it well, by the way. And you're not supposed to. But you handle it. And you go through. And I continue to go through. And those things that set before us in life that bring fear to our hearts. And just think a minute in your life, how many choices you have made out of fear. It's a lot. We are so controlled by fear. It's a powerful emotion. And we struggle with, we know we shouldn't be afraid. You know, I remember when I was a kid, somebody in our church had a sign that said, worry is a mild form of atheism. And I went, yeah, that makes sense. And worry, same thing as fear. It's, it's a mild form of atheism. And I don't want to be an atheist. I shouldn't worry and I shouldn't have fear. I haven't succeeded at that very well over the years. I'm afraid to tell you about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we all know how many opportunities we've missed because we were afraid of what might be, even though we know we should have acted. It's one of the things I pushed on my kids all the time. Life is just a series of choices, and if you have an opportunity in front of you, you need to take that opportunity if you think it's the right thing to do, because you may not ever get it again. We can't let fear run our life. I remember I was in Canada for special meetings once, and I got to ride on a barge through the locks on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Can you believe that? I was there, we were in a coat and tie, I was in between meetings, and the pastor of the church and I, we, we walked up there, and we were watching the boats come through the locks. St. Lawrence Seaway is just the major thoroughfare for boats, and I was like, we're behind the fence and that's not close enough for me and the gate's open. I said, well, let's walk down to the edge. And he said, but there's a sign that says, do not enter. I said, but if they really meant it, they wouldn't leave the gate open. <laughs> I said, I, said, I want to I wanna walk down, I want to be up close. And I said, what's the worst thing can do? Tell us to get out, right? So, I'm stupid me, right? I just, I just walked down and now I'm standing right at the edge of the wall and the boat's coming up. It is cool. And, and uh, the top, the, where the captain is is already well above us, and, and the ship's coming up as a big barge. Barely fits in there. All of a sudden, I hear a voice from above. Would you like to come up? <laughs> no, he's, he said, would you like to come aboard? And I'm like, what in the world? And I look up, and the captain is leaning out of the window. Out of the crow's nest, whatever it's called. I don't know what it's called. Bridge. There, that's a good one. And he goes, would you like to come aboard and ride up to the next lock? Well, yeah. And you can see the next lock. And I look at him and I said, you ready? You want to go? And like, you know, like, you know, this is, how many times am I going to ask to get on a barge and the lock's in the St. Lawrence Seaway? I'm taking my opportunity. But they may kidnap us. Well, they're really slow. They can't get far fast, right? <clears throat> you know, the fear, do we, and so, we, we start walking down to the end of the, to the lock where the, you know, the door's shut. And we start going up and we start walking across on the walkway, which is extruded steel. You can see all the way down and I'm not big on heights. And I'm like, 
<laughs> anyway, fear, but I said, I'm going on the boat. So I'm walking across. Well, everybody on the other side starts freaking out that these two rednecks are in suit and ties are coming, walking across. You can't come, you can't come. I said, the captain told us to. Oh, oh, come on. I'm going to use that line the rest of my life. The captain told me to. And, and so we walk around, and as we get to the other side, the boat's up far enough, and they drop the gangplank across. And he says, come aboard. The first mate was there. I'm like, aye, aye. So we walk across. The boat's still rising. And we get on. He goes, captain wants to know if you want to eat with the crew or come up to the bridge. I'm like, I want to go up to the bridge. Can I drive? And uh, so we go up the stairway, and we get on. And you're sitting up there with the captain on the bridge of this massive barge in the locks of the St. Lawrence Seaway. I'm like, can I drive now? He goes, no. <laughs> and so the doors open, and when the water gets level, and we pull out, and we're cruising. We, we just had an incredible conversation, asking him how all that works. And uh, we come up to the next one, and the doors open. I'm like, are you sure this fits in there? Because it does not look like it fits in there. And he's, yep, yep, it fits. And I kid you not, it looks like we had that much room on both sides. He pulls in, the door shut, and he goes, would you like to ride to the next one? And I'm like, I look back at our car way down there, and I got meetings to preach at. I said, we probably should get off here. I got to preach tonight. We had a great time. We went back down. They put the gangplank across. We got off, walked back around, and, and we got back to church that night. And we were telling everybody that I rode on, we got to ride on a barge in St. Lawrence Seaway. And they said, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. They don't do that. Yeah, they do. <laughs> We've lived here our whole lives. And never got to do that. I said, well, God doesn't love you. What can I say? <laughs> Fear could have kept me from saying yes. And then what would I have to tell you this morning for a story? Nothing. It was fun. Fear often, way too often, controls our heart's decision. How do we overcome fear? How do we have faith in the face of fear? We're going to look at the story of Daniel in the lion's den. If you turn with me, though, first to Hebrews chapter 11, I want to look at verse 33 where this name comes up. How do we deal with fear? I have a quote I'm going to put up here. Courage isn't the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is far more important than the fear. Let that soak in. We're going to leave that up there for a minute. See, a lot of people think that, you know, soldiers, cowboys that run into the battle with guns blazing, that they have no fear. No, they just realize that something is more important than the fear that they have. And I like this particular quote because courage isn't the absence of fear, but the, rather the judgment. The judgment. You weigh the truths about the reality that's in front of you, and you make a judgment call. And that judgment gives you the courage to face the fear because something is far more important than the fear that's in front of you. And we thank people like Daniel, and, and we look at Hebrews chapter 11. Again, we've been looking at these last few names here in verses 32 and 33. What more shall I say? Verse 32, time would fail to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, who we looked at last week, and the prophets. I'm not going to preach on all the prophets but who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, and shut the mouths of lions. That's the story of Daniel. Shut the mouths of lions. And we think, we look at people like Daniel, we look at people like Elijah and like Samuel and, and some of these great prophets, and we think, man, they are just, they are pros of faith. They're professionals. And we think they must have been born professionals in their faith. There's no way. They, of course not. And they're not pros anyway. They, they made plenty of mistakes. We get this wrong idea that pros are, are just something born into. They're not. They're not. They're, made over, they're not made overnight. There are many, many moments hidden away from anyone's view of countless hours of practice and sweat that no one ever sees. Michael Jordan didn't become Michael Jordan just one day when he's in his 30s decided to pick up a basketball and go play. I trained him. 
And he'd probably practice when he was a kid. Pros are not made overnight. Daniels are not made overnight. Elijah's, Samuel's are not made overnight. It is a long path of small acts of faith that sink our roots deep. You remember when Jesus gave the parable of the sower, and he said, you know, some seed fell on, on rocky ground, on shallow ground. He said, it sprouted up quick, but when the sun came out, there were no roots, and so it withered. But those are on the good soil, they sunk roots deep, and it takes a while for roots to go deep. And therefore, when the sun comes out, they don't wither because there's something solid underneath them. These people of faith, what we might call the professionals of faith, became that way over a long period of obedience and trust in God. And they still, of course, made mistakes. You need to understand that you're not going to be a pro overnight and a star of faith necessarily. We all are that way. Elijah had mistakes. All these guys had mistakes. But small decisions of trusting God in the long run begins to make us people who are easily available to make judgment calls of things that are more important than the fear we're facing, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. If you have a Bible, again, I ask you to turn back to Daniel chapter 6. It's about in the middle of your Bibles. Daniel chapter 6. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, right in there. Daniel chapter 6. Have you ever seen a picture or a painting of, of Daniel in the lion's den? Anybody ever seen any art of that? How many of you have seen it on a flannel graph? <laughs> Some of us old enough to the kids are going, what's flannel graph? I don't know. I'm not, too young to know that. Shh, Mike, what's laughing at me over there? <laughs> we see this, and it's always this young guy standing in front of a bunch of lions, right? And they're all just sitting there, and they're not eating him. Daniel was 80 years old, most likely, when he's thrown into lions then. Maybe that's why he didn't have fear. <laughs> he's just tired. Let him eat me, right? Huh? 80 isn't old, though, is it, Don? 80 is not old. No, Don knows all about it. Mary doesn't, but Don does. He's 80. You think, well, maybe that's why he had that kind of faith. Well, yeah, it may be part of it. Again, it's long work. But he's no young buck here. And with this man of great faith, you must understand that he, spoiler alert, he gets thrown in the lion's den, he doesn't get eaten, he gets taken out. He survives, in case some of you are worried and anxious. I don't want you to be afraid, right? He gets out. You think, well, anybody who has the right amount of faith, God is always going to rescue him. Nope. We're going to talk about that next week. But remember who Daniel is. He is a slave in a foreign land. And he still has faith. He still has integrity. And he's still obedient. And if God is so great and always rescues people of great faith, then why did he even get thrown into the den to start with? Why didn't he just protect him from that? We'll talk about that in a minute. But he is a slave in a foreign land, and he's been living with integrity all throughout his ministry. As a young boy, he will not eat the fancy food offered to him. He wants to eat what God has asked of them to eat, and he takes a chance and risks his life, and, and God blesses him for that, and he continues to be a man of integrity throughout his life. By the way, <clears throat> Daniel is the only, one of the very few, very few in Scripture that nothing negative is ever recorded about him. Isn't that right, Daniel? Aren't all Daniels that way? Pretty much? No? Yeah. Your dad's not here to refute that, is he? Daniel is one of the few people in Scripture that nothing negative is recorded about his life. I'm sure he made mistakes, but it's just not recorded. But he just continually makes decisions that are decisions of integrity in the face of fear. But he realizes, he makes a judgment that something is far more important than the fear that's in front of him. Daniel, if you don't know, is, becomes an interpreter of dreams in this foreign land. And he goes through a couple of kings during his lifespan. And in, in some of those cases, some of those kings have dreams and they want Daniel to interpret them and even tell them what the dream is ahead of time. And so they bring Daniel in to do that. The problem is that a couple of those dreams 
our condemnation of the king. In fact, one of the dreams is he has to tell the king, interpretation of the writing on the wall, that what does that mean? It means you're going to die tonight and your kingdom is going to be taken over. Can you imagine standing in front of the king who's waiting for an interpretation and the Lord gives it to you and you're thinking, oh, I ain't going to tell him that. I'm going to tell him that the lottery numbers are 15, 28, you know. Here you stand in front of the king who with just one word can have you killed at the moment. And you're faced with fear, but courage is making a judgment call that there's something more important than the fear that's in front of you. And he knows he has to be honest with his God and for his God. And so he tells him, here's the meaning of your dream. You're going to die tonight. And that happens a couple of times that the, his interpretations are not good, they're not positive. What we see in all that is that faith is long obedience in the same direction. If you can go up to the next slide, please. We talked about this on a couple occasions throughout our study in the book of Hebrews. And if you want to write that right there in your Bible by Daniel 6, faith is long obedience in the same direction. I love that line. And I wish I would have come up with it, but I didn't. Faith is long obedience in the same direction. Long obedience in the same direction creates within us an understanding of what is real and what is, uh, we should really be concerned about and what we shouldn't be concerned about and helps us to make judgments that give us courage in the face of immediate fear. Let's look at this story a little bit. Daniel chapter 6. Like I said, Daniel is 80 years old. The uh, kings have just changed control. We got a new king on the scene. His name is Darius. In chapter 6 of Daniel... It seemed good to Darius to appoint 100 Sundays, 100 Sunday? What in the world is that? 120 satraps. I was trying to get satraps in my head and then Sunday came out. 120 satraps over the kingdom that they should be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them, three commissioners. So you got massive kingdom, 120 kind of local governors, mayors, whatever you want to call them today. And then I'm going to take and get three commissioners who are over those 120. So each one will have 40 people, of whom Daniel was one. That these sad traps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. Now remember, Daniel's a foreigner. He is not part of that kingdom. He's basically a slave, but he has risen up to the ranks because he is honest and faithful. And God has elevated him in position. Verse 3, then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. So he gets put in charge with one of the three commissioners. And in that position, the new king sees him and goes, this guy is extraordinary. The only thing extraordinary about Daniel... He told the truth all the time. And he lived a life of integrity all the time. You don't have to be special to do that. But it sets you apart. Like nowadays, if, you just, if you're breathing and you show up to work, you'll probably become a CEO. <laughs> right? But breathing and showing up to work really isn't a major skill. One you do subconsciously. He was extraordinary because he was honest with his God and he had long obedience in the same direction over his entire life. And that's just, should be ordinary, but is instead extraordinary. And he begins to elevate himself. And the word gets around that this foreigner is going to get elevated to run the whole kingdom. We saw that in Joseph's life, didn't we? And then the one emotion sets in that sets in among a lot of people, and that's jealousy. Look at verse 4. Then the commissioners and the satraps 
began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. Wouldn't that be nice? That you take any government official and find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. E. <clears throat> but they couldn't find anything. What made him extraordinary? He was just righteous. Did the right thing. Inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of God. So jealousy sets in. We've got to take this guy out. We're not going to let this Jewish man run the show for us. This is our kingdom. I just want to say today, and, and maybe this is a message or a word for somebody, jealousy is so destructive to the one who has it, and of course, obviously, can be destructive to the one that it's aimed at. And the problem is that jealousy, although it is destructive, doesn't elevate you. Oh, it might change a position. You might be jealous of someone and get them knocked down and then you get their job, but it doesn't change the fact that you didn't have their job before. You see what I'm saying? If they're more qualified than you before you sabotage them, you're still not more qualified. You just might have their job. What I'm saying is this. What these guys should have done is elevated themselves. Changed who they were. And not worry about knocking someone else down. Because like every other sin, it will have a price. We should rise in our own hearts and minds. Become extraordinary by telling the truth and living a life of integrity. We find another truth here in verse 4 that I want to, I think is important to point out. They said they couldn't find any corruption or evidence of anything wrong in his life that they could convict him of, which doesn't make much difference anymore. He just makes stuff up and do it anyway, right? And that's what I want to understand. Just because you're living clean, not eating clean, but living clean, on your part does not protect you from trouble on the world's part. Evil is going to be evil. So just because you're living righteous does not mean that the world is going to leave you alone. In fact, they're probably going to bother you more because darkness always hates light. So it's not going to protect you from accusations and from jealousy and from anger and all the other things that go on. But here's what it does. Clean living won't keep you protected from the world necessarily, but clean living on your part puts the God of the universe squarely in your corner. So Romans 8 says, what can man do to me? If God is for me, who can really be against me? Please keep your finger right here in Daniel 6 because we're coming back. But I want you to look at that one more time. Romans chapter 8. Keep your finger there in Daniel 6, but jump ahead to Romans 8 for me. I just want you to see it with your own eyes one more time. Romans chapter 8. Verse 31 and 32. Paul is talking about the great God and the spirit that dwells within us and all the things that he has done, that he has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. We will be glorified. And then verse 31 of Romans 8, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? The answer to that is a lot of people. Paul's not saying that no one will be against you, but he's saying is what advantage does it really have, even if they are against you? That's a rhetorical question. Who can really be against us? And look at his reasoning, verse 32. This is one of my favorite verses. I read it all the time. He, God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. And he goes on to talk about that. If God is for us, who can really be against us? And if God did not withhold his only son, what else would he withhold from us? So if you have someone against you, he's saying, don't worry. Don't live in the fear of the world against you, because God is for us. That's the truth here. We see that 
Even though he was living clean, the world was still against him, but God was squarely in his corner, and that's what you want. God squarely in your corner. Verse 5, it says, um, if, it says they couldn't find any other accusation. He said, if we're going to find anything of accusation against him, back in Daniel, we're back in Daniel 6, it will have to be in regard to the law of his God. They knew that this guy was a believer in God every day, all the time. 24-7. They said, if we're going to get him, it's going to be in the law of his God. In somewhere, he is so consistent with his God. In fact, the word constantly serving the Lord comes up a number of times from Darius when he talks about Daniel. Again, we see the idea that faith is long obedience in the same direction. And that if we're going to get him, we're going to get him something to do with the law of his God because we know he will not alter what he does for his God. And so we need to alter something to catch him in what he's going to do. If someone were going to try to get you on something that you do consistently for the Lord, would they have any evidence to do that? Any consistency that, oh, we know we can trip them up in this. So they knew that they had to work something of his faith and make that a sin. So, you see verses 6 through 9. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as following, saying, King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials, the governors, have consulted together that the king should establish a statute. And enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. They knew that Daniel was a man of prayer. And that he prayed three times a day in his window looking towards Jerusalem wanting to go home. They said, he's not going to quit doing that. And they knew he wasn't going to quit doing that. So what they said, we've got to make a law change so that he can be in trouble for doing that. Now Darius is a new king. He's trying to make his mark. And they come to him and they butter him up. They flatter him. You know, king, we are so impressed with you. You're just, mm, you're an amazing king. Well, you know, I just had an idea. Maybe you should make a statute that for 30 days, for a whole month, no one can pray to anyone but you. It's, it'll set your authority in stone. They'll look at you as God. Well, <clears throat> you're right. Right? Flattery. Pride. Pride is such a dangerous, dangerous thing. And they go on. And said, if, if, and if anyone who doesn't do that, Anyone who doesn't pray to you shall be cast into the lion's den. Apparently they just kept one around. <laughs> now king establishes injunction, sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. Boy, the Medes and Persians, they were law people. And it was the law, of their law, that if something was signed and came into law, it could not be changed at all. And so they knew that that was his obedience, and they knew Daniel's obedience was prayer, so they put those two things together. King, sign this document. And remember, it can't be changed, because they knew Darius liked Daniel. Pride got him to do this. Pride is dangerous. Pride's most dangerous quality is its self-seduction. So that you can be manipulated by others to their ends, which leads you to very bad decisions. Flattery dumbs us down. Or at least it can. How many men have gone, <laughs> when a girl bats her eyes, or, you're so sweet, and like, uh -huh, what do you want me to do? Right? <laughs> Flattery. Flattery. I, I just got thinking about that. And I remember that 
This week I just looked at some quotes on flattery and it came up with some great ones. Flattery corrupts both the receiver and the giver. I like this one from Hank Ketchum. Flattery is like chewing gum. Enjoy it, but don't swallow it. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said, knavery and flattery are blood relations. And you're thinking, well, that's cool. It's knavery, right? That means dishonest scoundrels, right? Dishonest scoundrels and flattery are blood relations. Flattery and insults raise the same question. What do you want? Adelaide Stevenson, uh, presidential candidate from the 1800s. Don Meeser remembers him. <laughs> Larry's not here to bug. I've got to bug you, brother. Adelaide Stevenson said, flattery is all right as long as you don't inhale. That sounds like another president. And I don't, I don't think that's what he meant. But flattery is all right as long as you don't inhale. And here's one I really like. I don't know who this was from, but if we did not flatter ourselves... The flattery of others could never harm us. The problem with Darius was not that these guys were giving all these words to him, is that he was giving those words to himself and they just enforced it. Flattery usually comes with a price. Now sometimes you flatter someone just because you love them and you're nice. But a lot of times, in most cases, flattery comes with a price. I guess the question was, what do you want? And because he flattered himself and thought of himself as something big, when they came and told him he was something big, he just ate it up without thinking about the consequences. He signed the document way too fast. And immediately it turns to bite him. This is a call to stay humble. When people come and tell you you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, thank them and go on. But we need to stay humble. We need to stay humble. Look at verses 10 and 11. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open towards Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement, found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Once again, we see long obedience in the same direction. Now there are some Christians who, once something's passed against believers, they go out and they start doing it then just to buck the system. You know, We're not going to let them tell us. We're going to start praying now. That's not what Daniel did. Daniel had been praying. I'm just impressed an 80-year-old man can get on his knees three times a day. And get back up, right? And he said he just kept doing what he always did. He heard that it had been signed. And he had a choice to make. He heard it, and he said, I can't stop being who I am. He knew what the lion's den was about. He'd probably seen people thrown into the lion's den. He knew how gruesome and terrifying of a death that would be. <clears throat> but... Courage is not the absence of fear, but the judgment that there's something more important than the fear that's in front of you. And so he goes back to his room, as they knew he would, kneels in the same spot, and prays like he'd always prayed. Why didn't he just back up from the window? Why didn't he just pray in his closet for a month? It would solve the problem, right? He was not going to let the world tell him how to worship. And he had been doing it the way he had been doing it his whole life, and he was going to continue to do so. And he went right there. He knew they were going to come watch him. They were out there with their cell phones taking pictures so they could show it to Darius. It didn't take him long. Verse 12. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast in lion's den? The king answered and said, The statement is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persian, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, that's probably all they had to say. 
and all of a sudden he went, oh, oh, I forgot about Daniel. I was so flattered and prideful that did not think about what this thing really had a, this purpose behind it. They probably didn't even get the whole sentence out, but as soon as they said Daniel's name, he knew what had happened. He knew he had been snookered. And they said to him, Daniel, uh, where, Daniel, who was one of the exiles, verse 13, from Judas, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Long obedience in the same direction. That's what builds faith. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Flattery has revealed its price. Oh, this is what that was about. I just thought they loved me. I just thought they thought I was all that. Pride and flattery just turned ugly. Darius says he knew he tried to had to deliver him, and he tried till night. He couldn't do it. Verse 15. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that this is the law of the Medes and the Persians, and that no injunction or statute that the king establishes may be changed. Then the king gave orders. And Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you, and here it is, constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Darius is saying this. God's going to deliver you from my stupidity. That's what he's saying. I can imagine Daniel going, Why are you throwing me in? Well, they flattered me. Oh, thanks. The God that you constantly serve, long obedience in the same direction. Constantly. Constantly. That is why he was not afraid of the lion's den. And he did not know he was coming back out, by the way. We have that now, and uh, we know the story. But he didn't know that. Right? But he knew that there was something more important than the fear in front of him, and that's what gave him courage. You're going to have to throw me in, because I'm not going to go praying to my God. And his faithfulness and his long obedience in the same direction was changing Darius and Darius says the God whom you serve he's going to save you and I'm sure it was said with a little bit of hope in his voice verse 17 and a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing might be changed in regard to Daniel <clears throat> I don't know if it was a straight drop in if it was stairs, if it was a slide, I don't know. But they put him in and they seal a rock over it so he can't get back out. Can you imagine that drop? And you land and think, that's it? And you can hear the lions? I wonder if there's a split second at the top of the at the top of the den where he thought, I'll just I could deny or I could do something to get out of this. There's no way in the world he was not terrified about falling in there. But courage overcame the fear because he knew he'd rather live short and righteous than long and wicked. So you go in the den and let God do what he's going to do. He didn't know he was going to be delivered. Daniel is delivered, verse 19. Or verse 18, the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fled from him. <laughs> well, it's really nice that he didn't have any entertainment come in. Appreciate that. Notice he fasted, which is something Daniel had done. And it said no entertainment and he, and he couldn't sleep. He knew that his pride had cost this incredible, extraordinary man his life potentially. Verse 19, then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. And when he came near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, uh, Daniel, servant of the living God, 
Has your God, whom you, what's the word? Constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? <laughs> now, if I'm Daniel, I just wouldn't have said anything. Make him sweat. Or go, oh, you know. Daniel's way too nice. Verse 21, And Daniel spoke to the king, Oh, king, live forever. <laughs> Come down here with me, brother. My God, look at this. My God, send his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed him. Inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. He had obeyed the law. He threw him in. Now he's taking him out. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted, which is another word for faith, which is long obedience in the same direction, because he trusted in his God. I love the power of that moment. The, the lions hear commotion at the opening. They think dinner's coming. A little Hebrew, hmm, for supper. And as he comes down and hits the ground, an angel Lord appears. I just picture all the lions just bowing and stop and sitting quietly as the angel closes their mouths. In scripture, it talks all the time about the animals and all the obey God. And I, one of my favorite stories is they, the Philistines had stolen the Ark of, the God, of the Ark of God, the Covenant, Ark of the Covenant of God, and had put it in their temple, and their God kept falling over, worshiping the Ark, which God has a sense of humor. And it kept falling, they'd set him up, by the way, if you have to set your God up, not a God. And he kept falling over in worship, and they had plagues and all kinds of problems, and they finally said, we need to get rid of this ark. And they said, well, are we sure all these plagues are from God? He said, well, here's how we'll figure it out. We'll take the ark, we'll put it on a cart, a new cart, and get some new oxen, and, and we'll put the yoke on them and hook them to them, and we'll see where they go. If they walk towards Jerusalem, we'll know God is involved. If they just kind of wander around, then we'll know it's not from that, and we'll keep the ark. And they set the ark on the cart. They hooked the oxen up to it. They let go of the oxen. Beeline. Right back to Jerusalem. The oxen are under the command of God. The lions are under the command of God. <clears throat> he shut their mouths. And those who by nature would just absolutely tear that man apart sat there quietly all night long because Yahweh commanded it to be so. You think, if God shut the mouths of the lions, why didn't he just shut the mouths of the satraps and the commissioners and the governors? Why not just stop them from speaking and getting Daniel in trouble? Well, because unlike the lions, humans have free will and God will never break that barrier. In other words, you and I have to choose our own destiny. God will not make you choose him. When we pray for someone who's lost, Lord God, draw him. Well, he, he can draw him. He can do things to encourage that person to come, but he will never make them choose him. He will not shut their mouths or open their mouths. God is a God of righteousness, and his righteousness says, I give them free will. They have to make the choice, which is the message for you today. You've got to choose. If you're going to follow God, it's not that one day he's going to drag you kicking and screaming. You've got to make the choice. Well, sin has its price. Verse 24. <laughs> By the way, what are you thinking if you're one of the satraps? Uh-oh. Uh right? The king gave orders and brought those men who had uh, maliciously accused Daniel. And they cast them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Now there's a great verse for your kid's nursery. <laughs> Tough story. By the way, sin always has its price. Now the world beats up the church all the time. It beats up Christians all the time. 
The blood of the saints have cried out to the Lord ever since there have been blood of saints. And the world thinks there is no God because he never comes and strikes us down or there never seems to be any retribution for our sins against the church. Let me tell you something. Jesus is coming. And the wrath of God will be poured about on those who think that they are above reproach. The ones who cast the Daniels into lions then will themselves be cast into destruction. We seem to be getting our clocks clean sometimes. But faith says we're going to have long obedience in the same direction, and we trust that one day things will be set right. Verse 25, Then Darius the king wrote to all the people's nations and men of every language who are living in the land, May your peace abound. I make a decree in all the dominion of my kingdom. Men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God, an enduring God, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Amen. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Our faith, if done for God's glory, will give him glory and not us. Does God always save a life when they're faithful? No, not always. We're going to talk about that next week. We're not always saved today, but if we were on God, we will be saved tomorrow, meaning the days to come. Why didn't God always stop the mouths of lions for me, for you? In other words, you know, everything that's going wrong, we want God to fix it right then. He doesn't always. But I want to tell you something, that God has stopped the mouths of lions for you. And in the most important one that can be done. <clears throat> Scripture says that Satan prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. But God shoved a cross in his mouth to keep his bite from having any effect on believers. He's already shut the mouths of that lion through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that lion was seeking to devour you. And if you've come under the blood, that lion will have his mouth shut towards you. And God did it also by shutting one more lion's mouth. Revelation 5.5 says that, uh, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome. And so as to open the book... Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And this lion also had his mouth shut. Isaiah 53 says that he, Jesus, was oppressed. He, Jesus, was afflicted. Yet he, Jesus, did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep before, that is silent before its shearer. So he did not open his mouth. And he went on to his death so that you would have victory over the Lion of Satan. God closed the mouth of Jesus and kept him on track. Jesus is our high priest who can sympathize with our weakness, and he'll be a very present help in your lion's den experience. If the worship team would come up, I want to ask the question, what is your lion's den? Well, it's just me, isn't it? And the piano player. All right. Julie, you can come up. What's your lion's den? Are you in it right now, or you think it's coming? Let me tell you what your job is to do, simply to do, is to obey him even if you're in the den. And God will deliver today or he will deliver tomorrow, but you will be delivered if you live in faith. And that can give you peace in the midst of your battle. Judge something more important than the fear that's in front of you. So you'll be able to say today, it is well with my soul. And that's the song we're going to sing here in just a minute. Daniel slid into the den unafraid of what the immediate future was because he knew what the long-term future was with his God, which was eternal life. And he'd rather have that than to dishonor his God. He trusted God more than he feared man. And he trusted because he did, had long-term faith in God's goodness in his life. Therefore, even when he was getting tossed in, he could say, it is well with my soul. Is your soul well today? Jesus is the only answer if it's not. I ask you to stand and sing with me. We're going to sing just two verses of the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And if you're ready to give your life to Christ, I ask you to come up as we sing. Let's stand together.